city of Indianapolis. Very good. And my name is Mark Grant with Ice Miller, and I'm part of our green initiatives group that we have at the firm. Mm-hmm. My name is Alexia Donnie-Wold, and I'm with the city of Carmel. I'm a planning administrator with the Department of Community Services. Okay. I'm David Pippen. I'm the policy director for environment and natural resources for Governor Daniels. Yeah. And I'm You've been listening all this, haven't you? I have. Okay. <laughs> I'm Dave Summer. I'm the Indiana business leader for Train Commercial Systems. Okay. And I'm going to kick off our discussion today, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Like I said, I'm with Train Commercial Systems. Train is a global leader in comfort systems for buildings. Uh, myself, I've been in this industry for about 16 years. I am a lead accredited professional. Um, I'm going to go over some figures, some of them Mac talked about already, but really going to talk about the statistics on where energy is used in North America, where it's used in the United States, and just try and put a framework around uh, how we can attack all the aspects of whether it's renewable energy, whether it's producing energy, or our use of energy. Most of what I'm going to talk about is on, I'll call the demand side of the meter. And when we, when we make changes to buildings to be able to make the existing building stock more efficient, the return on that compared to building, whether it's uh, uh, energy generation systems, whether they're windmills or solar panels or the traditional coal and nuclear, it's about a 700% better return by attacking the energy we're already using, by reducing the amount of energy we're already using. So we'll go over some of the things Mac mentioned, which is 38% of the energy is used in buildings. Of that, um, you know, that's going to continue to rise. Some of the statistics show that there'll be 15 million new buildings in the United States by the year 2015. So our our need for energy, our thirst for energy, is going to continue to increase. We're not going to slow down progress. We're not going to slow down on our building. As a matter of fact, we're going to build about 15 million new buildings. Um, of that 38 percent of the energy used in buildings, um, my industry, or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, the Department of Energy says we use about 15 to 25 percent of that. So, so I'm sorry, let me go back. Of the, of the energy used in buildings, about half of it's used in the heating and air conditioning. So if you do all that math, it's somewhere between 15 percent and 25 percent of the energy used in North America is used in comfort systems in buildings. Compare that to transportation. The entire transportation industry, whether it's cars, trucks, railroad, uh, that uses about 12% of the energy in North America. So we talk a lot about cafe standards for automobiles, about miles per gallon, and that's all very important, but they're at about 12% of the total energy use. Buildings are at 38%. Comfort systems in buildings are about 15 to 25% of that total energy. So when we want to attack the problem, we've got to attack all those different facets of it, but the existing building inventory is certainly a, a big opportunity. We, we can go, companies like mine, we can go into an existing building that's as young as five years old and find 20% decrease in energy. We can go into buildings that are 10 to 15 years old and retrofit them to save about 40 to 50% of their energy. So the technology is advancing quickly, where we can affect the big difference is going back on the existing inventory of buildings and bringing the efficiency up in those. I think that it's a two-pronged approach, and, and that's a lot about lead for new construction. There's also lead for existing buildings. We talk mostly about lead for new construction, so we sort of draw a line in the sand that says, from this day forward, all our new buildings will meet these standards. I think that's great. Uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile. What we need to look at is existing stock of buildings. Yeah, the statistical data you just quoted because I don't think there's one out of ten members of Congress that believes that we're, we're using more energy in buildings than we are in the cars and trucks and transportation. Right. So if you've got that statistical data, I'd like to have that. I'll be glad to provide that to your staff. Okay. And I think that is, you know, it's not as sexy as talking about cars, trucks, and automobile industry. I don't know about sexy. But it's <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you switch a little bit to carbon emissions, that's the other thing we hear a lot about is carbon emissions. In the United States, about 30% of the carbon emissions are attributed to existing buildings. 
In New York City, about 70% of the carbon emissions are attributed to existing buildings. So you know, lots of different aspects of green and environmental, and, and invariably, whenever I'm uh, talking about green and talking about environmental responsibility and talking about the things we need to do, um, it, it comes around to energy. Energy is a big, big part of the environmental responsibility. There are other pieces to it. You know, we're very concerned about fresh water supply, certainly concerned about um, urban sprawl and things of that nature, but the topic that comes around to most and that has a significant return on investment is energy. Uh, let's see if I have anything else that I wanted to make sure we touched on um, before I pass it on to my colleagues. I think the other thing that I felt was important to share, uh, back to what you said, Congressman, that folks don't often realize is an existing building, we usually say about 2 to $4 per square foot is used for energy. So if we can go in and reduce that energy consumption by, say, 40%, it's significant savings. There's studies out now and where we're, where we're headed, and the studies are getting, um, I guess, uh, more and more reliable. There's studies that show that in a white collar building or an office building, the price per square foot for labor is about $300 per square foot. So if energy is 2 to $4 a square foot and labor is $300 a square foot, if I can prove to you that some of the comfort systems and some of the conservation issues and the daylighting and the fresh air can affect productivity by 1%, by 2%, it dwarfs the amount of energy, uh, the amount you're spending on energy. So the studies are getting better. Mac quoted a couple of them on schools and increasing test scores and reducing absenteeism and teacher retention. Uh, PNC Bank has done a study where they're building branches that are LEED certified, and they're studying the productivity in those branches compared to the branches that are not LEED certified. They're finding that the branches that are LEED certified have more deposits, the folks sell more loans, they have uh, higher customer satisfaction and higher employee retention. So I think as time goes on, we're going to hear more and more about those studies, and that's where another significant impact can be made is on productivity and the worker satisfaction. That's a big expense to builders. That's uh, really all I had, so I'll pass it on to uh, David to address what the governor's doing, right? Yeah, I, I actually, as I said, listened to the scope of what I was going to talk about has expanded quite a bit. First thing that I, I'd really like to address is the 49th out of 50 greenest states uh, comes from a Forbes article from earlier this year. Uh, what really isn't discussed about that is the data that underlined, uh, underlies that study was data from 2003 through 2005 primarily. The most recent information that they used in that was 2006. Uh, I say that because we're pretty proud of what the governor's accomplished in the last uh, four years. Uh, including uh, this morning I was up in Lake County uh, work at a ceremony with Congressman Muskowski, uh congratulating him and I want to thank you uh, as well on the passage of the Great Lakes Compact mm -hmm. uh, which was a major uh, piece of legislation that was negotiated between the eight Great Lakes states, two Canadian provinces to preserve the quantity of water in the Great Lakes to, shop, to stop uh, efforts to ship the water overseas or to other parts of the country. Uh, because they are the Great Lakes, as much as we'd like to think, they're not a renewable source. They're, there's a very low turnover in the Great Lakes. So thank you for your support and, and helping us get that passed. Uh, in addition to that, in the four years of the governor's uh, uh, time in office, the first two times that Indiana has met the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, including this year, uh, Indiana has met the ozone standard for the new EPA uh, standards of 0 .6, uh, 0 0.76 parts per billion on ozone. So those are the first time in Indiana history since we had the Clean Air Act and the monitoring for the NACs that Indiana has met the Clean Air uh, standards. On land, we've doubled the number uh, of trails in Indiana in the governor's time, and we've increased land purchases for conservation purposes 31% over previous four-year periods. Uh, when we took over the longest the oldest wastewater permit that we had in the hopper had expired 19 years before it had, before we got here. So it had been expired for 19 years. 
we have so reduced the backlog of expired permits, and understand, when you start talking about 19 years in environmental law, that's a long time. That's a sea change of what kind of standards and regulations are being applied to industry and to businesses and to people that are discharging. So you start reducing that, it's significant. We are one of only eight states to receive a two-star award from EPA for reducing those backlogs, bringing companies into compliance with more modern and current and protective standards. We've reduced the backlog in uh, the water permits by over 80%, in air by almost 98%. That's, those are significant uh, achievements. So there's been a lot of change in the governor's four years. So the data that underlines that 49th uh, really is not a reflection on the governor's leadership. We've done quite a bit. Uh, moving back towards energy, uh, the governor, when, when he came in, did the Hoosier Homegrown Energy Plan, which was the first time in 20 years the state had an organized plan uh, for how we're going to deal with energy issues. In that, we have increased uh, ethanol production from one plant to, I believe it's now eight plants that are operating, soy, biodiesel, ethanol. We're working on doing domestic production. We went from no E85 pumps in the state to over 100 E85 pumps in the state. Uh, and we're supporting uh, the coal gasification uh, initiatives and working on the Duke Edwards Port plant, which would be the first time a commercial scale gasification plant would be produced to prove that you can burn coal cleanly. You can remove the pollutants out of the coal cleanly. Everywhere else in the country, they're rejecting these plans by saying that there's no data to prove that these plants work. Well, somebody has to do it. We're, we're a state that relies on coal for 95 to 98 percent of our electricity. We want to show it can be done. Let's get the data. Let's prove it can be done and show that we can use this coal until we have other technologies that are going to keep us with electricity. Uh, now we get back to, to kind of the topic of the day. Uh, there's, currently, there's a lot of projects in the plans, but uh, USGBC has 10 LEED certified uh, buildings listed as being part of the, the, the um, state's inventory, uh, private and public. Five of those LEED certified buildings are state-owned buildings. The last five buildings uh, that were constructed by the state of Indiana are all LEED certified. Uh, the most recent is silver level certified. The one before that was, is certified. It came up one point short of silver level uh, certification, and it was just a problem that happened uh, during the construction phase that stopped it from doing that. Uh, Indiana also has 50 Energy Star certified buildings. So. It's not, we're, we're, we're definitely starting from behind, but Indiana is getting it. We're starting to build these kinds of buildings and we're working on it. Uh, in the session last time, uh, there was a, a bill that the legislature was working on that would be a mandate uh, for uh, lead certification on buildings. Uh, it got bogged down uh, on various other issues. Uh, we were watching it and when we saw that it wasn't gonna pass, uh, the governor said, let's get the people together, let's sit around the table, let's figure this out. Uh, Bill was one of the, one of the folks that, that sat down and helped us work this out, but we got environmental groups, industry groups, uh, architects, everybody to sit down. We worked through the issues, and in July the governor issued an executive order requiring uh, all new construction and all renovation projects and the operation and the maintenance of state-owned buildings, including universities, to be designed and operated and maintained for, to maximize energy efficiency. One way that you can demonstrate that you're maximizing energy efficiency is to look at some of these uh, different groups. A LEED Silver uh, certification, a Green Globes Two Star, or an Energy Star are certifications that are going to say you're saving taxpayer money. You're building a building. You're taking a, an energy efficiency mindset into this. Uh, the governor specifically had this written up to say, we're leading by example, we're going to provide the data to show that this stuff works. Because everything that you saw earlier shows that it only makes business sense. It's, there's efficiency, there's taxpayer money, there's all of that, but it's also the well-being of, of your employees, uh, you know, in our case, state workers, keeping people on the job, doing the people's uh, business and saving taxpayer money. So we've gone through uh, all of this. We will continue to work with 
universities, with our agencies, with department administration to continue building these uh, buildings and doing that. At the same time, we are very mindful of what's going on uh, internationally and nationally on energy issues. And one of, the, one of the targets that we've got is the Model Energy Code. The Model Energy Code from 1992, what we're currently using, uh, it's between us and Tennessee right now. There's 17, I think, states that don't have a statewide energy code. Of those that have a statewide energy code, Indiana and Tennessee are using the 92. Uh, that being said, the uh, International Energy Code Commission just last, end of, end, two weeks ago, ratified the 2009 energy code. We've already got people right now working on the analysis of that. Uh, it's not going to be printed until March, but we're looking at the proposals that were ratified to look at it and say, what got done? What, what are we looking at? What are the fiscal? What, what works? What doesn't work? And that is something that we're, we're actively pursuing because uh, the theory of the, of the energy codes is to improve energy efficiency about 2% a year. So if you just look at the fact that, that we've got a 16-year-old uh, energy code right now, your baseline, and these are all only class one structures, commercial, industrial, anything larger than a, a two-family structure, uh, you're looking at about a 32% uh, increase in energy efficiency in theory just on the, on the minimum building requirements. So whether we get into LEED and, and get everybody building LEED or not, if we can move the, the baseline to say the minimum construction standards, we're going to, make, we're going to require you to have a 32% increase in efficiency, that's going to be a, a, a pretty big change. Uh, we are also working, uh, Purdue has an analysis program that they work with commercial and industrial uh, facilities to in, decrease energy costs to look at analyze and say, how do we do these retrofits? What are we going to do? How can we reduce? Uh, we support and, and work with Purdue on doing that. We're also working on a couple initiatives to spread that out more to uh, the residential uh, area to say, what's the impact? It, the, the huge returns on investment are uh, using uh, more compact fluorescent lighting in the house, uh, 10 lights uh, replacements in a, in a house has a significant a decrease in energy usage. The largest or the greatest return on investment is a programmable thermostat so that you can install your programmable thermostat in the house and you can vary your temperature so it doesn't need to stay 72 degrees when you're at work. So you decrease your energy usage that way. There, there are things that, that work like that that we're working on but again we back up to, to what we started with and, and where we've where we've gotten to in these four years, there's going to be a lot more that happens. Uh, the times have changed in those four years as to what energy costs. Indiana's a low-cost energy state. There hasn't been an incentive for a long time for any Indiana to build, to maintain, to operate using energy efficiency. Energy costs have skyrocketed. As that's happened, people have said, okay, talk to us. Tell us how to do it. So that's, that's something that, that we've really paid attention to. The big thing that, that we did in, in the executive order, though, was we wanted to maintain flexibility. We wanted to say, we're not going to tell you this is the standard. We're not going to tell you, uh, you know, here's how you're going to have to do this. When What we wanted to do is say, here's the goal that we want to achieve. And you figure out what gets us to energy efficiency. How do we, how do we get there? Some people have, a, have specific... Uh, ideas in their head when one of the things that you heard talked about was green building and people have a problem with green building. I'm a big one that says let's start with high performance building. Let's start talking about energy efficient building. Somebody who tells you that they're not going to listen to you when, when you start talking about green buildings because well that's you know California stuff and we're Indiana we're not going to do that. They don't have that same reaction when you start by saying, let's talk about energy efficiency, let's talk about high performance, let's talk about workplace environment. So very small tweaks in the language that we use has a really big impact on how we do these kinds of sales and how we present it and, and educate the people. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. And, you know, goodness, the, well, the topics that we started with, we, well, we could go for hours. I just but, have one question, and what are the other members of the panel? And that is, uh, I think uh, one, of the, one of the engineers said that uh, uh, 
they built this library down in southern Indiana, and they, the solar panels produce more energy than they need. And uh, there's a limit uh, on how much the electrical company can pay for the buyback on the energy that they create. Uh, is there any indication that we can raise that to create more incentives for people to use wind, solar, and other energy sources that could be uh, produce revenue for them, to, uh, not only to uh, take care of the current energy costs, but offset other costs they might have? I, I can't get into some of the details of some of the things that we're working on because it's for the governor to announce, not for me. But yes, I mean, we're, we're working with the utilities, and, and there are several barriers uh, that are in place that need to be removed that, that we're working on. All right, well, I didn't know it was classified. I just didn't it, know. It's not that it's classified. It's, we're, we're here talking about the ways to help, you know, reduce energy demand and that sort of thing. But I, that's just one of the things you might tell the government when you talk to them. Absolutely. Next time I see them, I'll just say that. I can know personally five people that have not gotten solar panels just because of that. Okay. Well, I will, I will talk to Mitch myself about that when I see him, and I know you will as well. And that, that seems to me a, a no-brainer. If they create an extra 25% uh, more energy than they're going to use and they could sell it back to the utility, it seems like to me something that... But that's, that's a decision for you guys to make, but I will... There are a lot more things than just that that need to be addressed, though, with how our utilities are structured. I'll leave all the rest up to you. I'll just talk to you about that one. Yep. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Actually, think yeah. I actually think I'm going next. Um, it's been a busy week for environmental sustainability here in Indianapolis. Uh, last Friday, Mayor Ballard announced Sustain Indy, which is his uh, broad reaching agenda to aggressively make Indianapolis a more sustainable city. And with that announcement, he also announced the creation of the Office of Sustainability, um, which will work across city departments to lead sustainability initiatives, both within city government and also with the community in partnership with the Green Commission. Um, and one of the first things that the Office of Sustainability has done is we've released a, an RFI to retrofit 10 city buildings. Um, the city is not in a position to build any new, new buildings right now. We've got plenty, but we can make the ones that we have more energy efficient. So that's one of the first tasks um, that was identified for the Office of Sustainability to do, is to look at the energy efficiency within city buildings. Ideally, we would like to make the city-county building um, the flagship for green buildings in Indianapolis. Um, it has a long way to go to get there, but that's been identified as one of the priorities of this office by the mayor um, to make the city county building, its prime location downtown, a great example of what a green building can be. And obviously, energy efficiency is a big part of that. Um, energy efficiency, you know, it, it, it is a huge cost savings for taxpayers, and that's really what we're looking for: is how can we make sustainability decisions which impact our bottom line in a positive way, which relates to a cost savings for taxpayers. Um, something else that we will work on along with the Green Commission, um, it's, it's been mentioned by both panels that there really are no incentives for green building here in Indiana, specifically in Indianapolis. And the Green Commission identified that as something that they um, have chosen to work on in the past year. And um, that's something that this office will do, is coordinate the development of incentives for green buildings within the city. That takes a lot of work. It involves you know, changing ordinances and zoning, um, putting together the incentive packages as well. So that's something that we will lead with the Office of Sustainability to work across city departments to do that. Um, we've identified some short-term and long-term goals to create some incentives for, for the private sector here at Indy to encourage them to have more green buildings, more energy efficient buildings. Um, and that's something that we hope to announce soon. We're definitely not there. We've been in existence for a few days now, um, but that's, that's been identified as one of our top priorities is looking to increase the energy efficiency in the current buildings we have, as well as providing some incentives for green buildings here in Indianapolis. Um, one of the announcements that the mayor's been making a series of announcements this week, he'll actually be here on Friday at KIB to talk about green buildings, specifically green roofs. Um, that's one way that we are looking to, in relation to energy, we're also looking to green other aspects of the city, including our um, combined sewer overflow and our long-term control plan. And right now there's no green roofs in the city, um, with the exception, I think, of the one on the IMA building. Um, KIB has a white roof, if I'm correct. Um, that's part of the, their lead certification here. Um, but there is a green roof being planned to be put on a lift station as part of the uh, long-term long control plan. And there's also a green roof that is be, it's in construction, the building is in construction right now from the private side, 3 Mass, which is a condominium um, complex going up on Massachusetts Avenue. So that's just one example of 
a, you know, something green that can go into building besides energy efficiency. And we're here to help put those incentive packages in place, um, both from the permitting side and from the tax side. So that's one thing that this office is working to do from a local level. Um, I was sent down from the city of Carmel, kind of known as the queen of green up there, so I think that's why they sent me down here to talk to some, um, about some of these things. I'd like to talk about some of our um, initiatives in Carmel, some of the most recent ones and the most exciting ones um, for me. Most recently, we um, passed a, a no idle policy. It was an executive order from the mayor for city employee vehicles. They have about 400 vehicles with the city. So this no idle policy will say that um, if they're driving somewhere and they stop, they need to um, turn the car off instead of waiting and, and leaving the car running. If they you know, go to, um, if they stop at City Hall and, and they're waiting for somebody, or if they um, run to the store, if they are, you know, say for a um, drive through for a bank instead of driving through, park and, and walk in. Um, and we estimate that if we reduce idling by 10 minutes a day per vehicle, we could save over $100,000 per year. So not only are we saving carbon emissions and um, pollution from the air, but we're also hopefully going to be saving some money. Um, we also recently finished a wind power study at the um, wastewater treatment plant. We had a meteorological tower up there studying um, the possibility of having um, using wind power there. And we're still analyzing the data, but we've got a full year of data, and um, we're estimating it's about an average. We've seen an average of 10 mile per hour winds, and hopefully we'll be able to, um, after we get some more um, information and, and discuss the wind generators, hopefully we'll be able to install some wind turbines there and, and get some wind um, power for the wastewater treatment plant. We're working with uh, North Coast Wind and Power on that, and they're doing the study for us. Um, so that's very exciting, and I'm excited to see the results of that. Um, some other little things that we've been doing, we recently expanded our recycling facilities. Now we offer free recycling drop-off for um, citizens at our household hazardous waste site, which we didn't offer before. We had a small site that took um, some recycling, like white paper and... Um, and aluminum cans, but now we're taking paper, cardboard, um, plastic, glass, and metal at the um, household hazardous waste site. Um, it's very, very excited, very proud of that. And also, um, you may have heard about the Indy, Indigo Commuter Express bus service that is now running from Carmel to downtown Indy for commuters who you know, daily need to drive down there, and, and now we're reducing the amount of um, emissions and cars that are on the road that will be driving back and forth from Carmel to Indy, which is a pretty long commute, and um, I think we'll save a lot of carbon emissions from the air with that as well. Um, in relation to some of the things that we've been doing, we've also run several awards for that, which I know the mayor is always happy um, when that happens, and, and it definitely looks good for the city. We recently won the Governor's Award for Environmental Excellence um, for Pollution Prevention, and that was in regards to um, our wastewater treatment process and the disinfection process. Instead of using chlorine, which we were going to um, expand, have to expand our chlorine tanks and use more, they decided to switch to ultraviolet light to kill the bacteria. And then when that is released back into the water, um, it's, it's better for the environment. You don't have the chemicals in there, and um, it's a cleaner process. Um, also, we received the 2008 Award of Excellence for Community Trees, which was um, sponsored by the Home Depot and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, that was given to Citizens for Green Space, which the city partnered with, and it was a $25,000 award, which will go to plant more trees and um, help the city in their efforts in the urban forestry program in their efforts to plant more trees. Uh, since 1995, we've planted about uh, 42,685 trees and just about 500 um, since 2007. So we're really working a lot. We work with planting street trees. Um, along the city streets as well as working with neighborhoods to get more trees planted within the neighborhoods which um, provide many benefits including you know, shade and um, aesthetic benefits as well as um, taking carbon out of the air and, and releasing oxygen. And then um, another award that we received was from the um, U.S. Conference of Mayors again um, 2008 Climate Protection Award for the roundabouts and I'm sure you've heard all about our roundabouts up in Carmel and the mayor is very proud of those. Um, there are many benefits with those as well, not only safety, which is one of the um, big benefits that is um, publicized. Redu we've seen um, accidents reduced with injury by about 80% at the roundabouts. Um, but it also 
reduces idling. So instead of having to stop at the stoplight, you yield and then you go through the roundabout and you keep going. So you're not idling, letting all these emissions go into the air. And um, we save about 228 tons of carbon dioxide a year. And about, um, we save about 24,000 gallons of gas per year. So it's a benefit to our air quality. It's also a benefit to citizens. They're not wasting their gas um, idling at these lights. And we also have reduced electricity use because we don't have any mechanical um, signals to maintain at the stoplights um, or at the intersections. No stoplights, just roundabout. Um, and also, there's some of them have less pervious or impervious surface because in the roundabout there's a green space or um, so we have a water fountain or some other structure in the middle of the intersection instead of just a sea of, of pavement. Um, in the future, we hope to, um, we're starting to audit our zoning ordinance, so we would like to try to include more um, green building into the city. Um, we're looking at barriers that are there right now. How can we take some of these out of our zoning ordinances so we do encourage the you know, private sector to build more of these green buildings? Um, I don't believe we have any LEED certified buildings within Carmel. Um, I've heard of a couple. I got the first one. Um, is it like the Castellia? Okay, yeah, in um, Village of West Clay? Yeah. Okay, and that certification has gone through? And no, it's certified, yeah. Great, that's great to hear. Um, so we have one, at least, um, and we'd like to encourage that more. So we're going to try to remove any of these barriers within our ordinances that um, would deter people from doing that and hopefully provide some incentives. We're still looking at that and trying to see how we could um, make it more, uh, make it better for people to um, build green and make it worth their while. So, and then we've got a whole list of other things that we're doing at a local level, you know, that's good for the environment, and, and we think we're trying to do our part where some things are small, but, you know, everything, every little bit counts, and um, we hope to do more in the future. Um, we've also got a great citizens group um, up in Carmel that's recently formed called the Carmel Green Initiative. So they're kind of working from a grassroots level, we're working from, you know, top-down level, and we have a great working relationship with them, and, and they're helping to, you know, educate citizens and um, provide information out there, and then also um, working with the city to help make it more green. And I believe Leslie Webb is here representing uh, the Carmel Green Initiative, if you'd like to talk to her later. But um, that's some of the things that are happening up in Carmel, and we're pretty excited about that, and thank you for having us here. Very good. Well, I guess as the last speaker, um, as I mentioned before, I'm with Ice Miller, and I'm a real estate attorney there, and I work primarily with developers. And so one of the things I wanted to conclude with is, is from that perspective, as I deal with um, the developer clients and they're trying to do these green buildings or sustainable buildings that we've been talking about, what type of issues do they face um, that, you know, maybe, and it really ties into what we've talked about from a federal, state, and local level, you know, what type of initiatives can federal, state, and local put out there, and Congressman, you mentioned this before, to help these types of developments go along. Um, and some of these we've already mentioned, so I can, I, I can scan through them fairly quickly, but I want to just highlight a couple. One that we have talked about uh, is the zoning. And David, is David back in here? But they actually face that issue with this, this building. They have turbines up on top here. And our office went through and worked with um, David to try and go through the, the Indianapolis zoning process to deal with the turbines. And um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this yet, but it, there were some issues with those turbines. And I think as, and eventually had to go through a variance process to get the turbines approved. But as the developers look at doing the buildings, putting some of these green initiatives, sustainable initiatives into the buildings, it doesn't always match up with zoning ordinances, and I, I think it, you know both of you have already mentioned, and some others did as well. These need to be looked at to try and help these these buildings make it through the process. So it's not trying to make the process faster or anything like that, but it's really trying to make it easier to do these types of, of facilities. Um, it, you know, somebody else mentioned about you know the energy code and, and building codes and stuff, but. You know, at least for some people, the idea of, of the, the greenest building or the most sustainable building is taking a building that's already in existence and rehabbing it. And some say that's, you know, the, the best use to make. But also as you're rehabbing that building, that's, that's a very old building, you may run into some issues with the building codes. But somebody's already mentioned, you know, those types of things are being looked at as well. Um, the... 
the flip side of that would then be what are some of the incentives, and, and, and we've talked about that. Also, one you know example that I wanted to point out, I do a lot of affordable housing type work and for um, low-income housing tax credits. And in the, the application that you go through in order to get those credits, there are points that you can get for having uh, green initiatives in there. And you know that's a great way to try and promote uh, green building. But what's interesting, and, and this was brought out in a couple of contexts, is the builder, the developer may put all this green in there, but the, the low income housing tax credit program is a rental program. And you know, you mentioned programmable thermostats. It's great to have those in the you know in the unit, but if the residents of that unit don't know how to operate those, then you've lost the entire benefit of, of putting those in. And I guess that's really more of a question than anything else. Is you know those types of things have to be addressed as we talk about education that we sort of kicked this off with is making sure that people that are using these systems are, are educated uh, about these systems. Um, it, you know, as far as federal incentives, there definitely are uh, incentives out there. In fact, a number of them were just extended mm -hmm. as a part of the, the bailout legislation that went in place. That's, that's the one part I liked. I didn't like the president. Um, so that's that's sort of interesting. Um, another big thing that, um, and somebody mentioned insurance earlier, but as people are building these types of facilities, you know, one thing to look at is, you know, the insurance that's in place. And as I'm talking to our developer clients, it's, it's telling them, you know, if you're doing a green roof, there's some different risks involved if you have a green roof on your building. As we look at making the buildings maybe a little bit tighter from an airflow perspective, you know, maybe there's a little more mold out there. And so, you know, we have to look at the insurance products that are out on the market, and there's a lot of change going on in the insurance industry right now to try and make the insurance products that are out there uh, greener, so to speak, to, to help protect these types of, of buildings. But it's really trying, I try and get our, our clients engaged with their insurance agent to make sure that what they're building um, is going to be is going to be covered, and, and then that also ties in from another insurance perspective. Um, and we have a, a number of architects and engineers that are here, but for their professional liability insurance, um, how does this all relate when you're out there and you're saying to an owner, you know, you're going to have a lead building, or you know, what exactly are you saying to the owners, and how does that relate back to your insurance coverage then? Um, and you know another aspect of that that I try and relate to the developer clients is if you're putting in, um, for example, uh, you know an HVAC system that is maybe a high performance system or some other type of system within the building that is maybe a little bit new, a little bit unique. You know what are the warranties that are on that system, and are those warranties strictly it's going to operate, or are those warranties that it's going to operate to a certain level? and a certain performance level. And that's something that everybody you know, always needs to take a look at. And, you know, again, for the developers that are going through and doing these types of buildings, you know, obviously they have contracts in place. You know, if they're an owner, you have a contract with your general contractor, you have a contract with your architect. How is all this green dropped into those contracts? And um, someone mentioned... Um, well, I think it was Dave mentions you know some of the health benefits of doing you know the studies that are out there for these types of facilities, and if if I'm a developer and I'm saying to you know somebody I want as my tenant, you know come into my building because it's going to be a lot healthier in my building than somewhere else. Well, how does how do I get that into a contract to say you know it's going to be a healthier building and what type of liability does that does that create? And then how do I turn around to my architect or how do I turn around to my contractor and get from them the, you know, the warranties that they're going to build it in a certain way or design it in a certain way. Um, so th these are just some of the issues that, that are faced out there. Um, and probably the last thing I wanted to mention as we talk about green communities, and this is really a, more of a residential comment than it is anything else, is one of the things that we are starting to see in a lot of you know planned communities, you have covenants, conditions, and restrictions that are out there in your community, and you know a number of those will you know I have some examples, but a number of those will maybe prohibit clotheslines, you know maybe they'll prohibit solar panels, maybe they'll prohibit compost piles or vegetable gardens, and as we're looking at greening the communities, 
then even those types of documents we have to go in and we have to look at as a community and say, you know, we need to allow these types of things in our communities. And so for people that are building new communities, you know, they really need to spend a lot of time going through those types of contracts and, and looking at those contracts and seeing what's in there. And if you're already in a community and you and your neighbors want to do something to, to green that community, you may have some subdivision restrictions that are in place that, that need to be looked at um, and talk about, you know, how do we, how do we amend those types of, of provisions. And then, you know, there are some homeowners associations that are out there that are now within that homeowners association, they have committees or a committee that's set up to look at green and sustainable ideas within their community. And so that's sort of a, a wave that we're seeing happen. Um, but that's, that's really it for my comments. Churches as well. What's that? Churches around the, the community have really uh, started getting into having committees looking at greening the church first and then having green ministry to start teaching. So when we start talking about the education process, uh, that's something that you're seeing quite a bit of in, in Indianapolis at least. I, I'm pretty sure it's happening throughout, yeah. but the churches are, are getting really involved and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work going back to pulling biblical passages, tying all of this to tending the garden and, and everything else. It's, it's, it gets quite interesting. That's, that's interesting. I, I, that's that's the first I've never heard. Of. When I go to church next Sunday, I'll have to listen to it more closely. Yeah. I guess. Well, uh, let me just end up by saying, uh, my staff, I'm sure, has made notes on all this. Uh, I will uh, commit to uh, doing whatever I can to be of help to all of you, contractors, builders, uh, engineers, uh, uh, to uh, see if we can't educate and help move this entire process along. I think it's inevitable that what, you, what you're what you talking about is, is, is going to happen, it's going to increase uh, fairly rapidly because the catalyst for a lot of this is going to be the energy problems that we face and the, the, cost, of, uh, the cost of energy. So uh, I will do what I can to work with all of you. Uh, if you have any suggestions that you can give to me, I look forward to working with you and the governor on some of these things and uh, the mayors uh, as well, Mayor, uh, Mayor Naps and, uh, and uh, throughout my district, all the mayors. Uh, but if you have any suggestions of what we can do in Washington, uh, I'll be glad to carry the ball for you over there, and I will become a member of the caucus, as you suggested. I think. All right, make sure I do that tomorrow, first thing. And uh, uh, I really want to thank you all very, very much for coming here. I know that it takes an awful lot of uh, time out of your schedule, and you're very important people. You, you do a lot of things politically and business-wise and legally, and uh, this is probably the way you want to spend your day, but I really appreciate it because it gives me the information I need to go back and try to help out uh, a little bit in Washington, D.C., and I will coordinate with the mayors and with the governor's office everywhere we can to, to make sure we move this process forward. Anyhow, anybody else have any last-minute comments they want to make before we leave? Congressman, just a reminder that uh, for those of you in attendance, there will be a meet and greet at Tino's Vino down the way tomorrow. Uh, meet and greet where? At Tino's Vino. It's down in the uh, town square area. And uh, just for anyone who's coming to the town. Tino's Vino. Tino's Vino. Tino's Vino. I have to have my staff guide me in that direction because I don't know who that is. But anyhow, yeah, thank you all very much. Well. What is that? Not too far. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We really appreciate it. Very thank much. you. Thank you. Thanks, man.